Gene? Well, I think I think it was my brother Sandy. Um, he's uh, known to be very frank, and so it was it was interesting that we had this practice session prior to going to a professional tournament, and it was during my first year on the tour, and I really played very badly my first year, and so we're driving back, and he turns to me, goes, "What the hell are you doing?" <laughs> and I went what do you mean and he said do you realize how much game you have and how much variety you're overdoing overplaying you're 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 outthinking yourself if you play the percentages and tone it down a little and and work harder in the points and don't go so quickly for the elaborate life will become very easy no one is going to be able to beat you and and to me it was like do less almost, but it was, it was harder work in the points, but it was, it was not taking the easy way out as I was taking. And so that to me was a, a huge eye opener in terms of what it was to play really percentage tennis, uh, where you would win day in, day out when you're expected to get to the semis or better of every tournament every year. How do you put together that kind of consistency? I, I remember in Brad Gilbert's Gilbert's book, Winning Ugly, uh, him talking about one time where he beat McEnroe. Maybe it was his first time of beating McEnroe. And McEnroe was so flummoxed at the end or during the match or at the end. I can't, can't remember right now, but McEnroe looked it up and he said something derogatory about Gilbert's game. And Gilbert inside, I think, was was laughing because he's beating McEnroe and he's he's got a, a strategy to do it and it's working. And there was nothing McEnroe could do. You know, this highly talented individual, great mind, great skill set. And now he's getting beat by a guy who's winning ugly. So I don't know if you remember that portion, but have you ever talked to Brad about those types of strategies? Well, Brad is, is, you know, is a genius at himself, not having a lot of artillery, but using it very well and also getting um, players to be able to believe in themselves. So uh, when you think about John McEnroe and Brad Gilbert, you almost think Brad Gilbert should be ball boying on talent, <laughs> you know, that he doesn't really even deserve to be on the same court. Um, but it's a vastly different thing when it comes to the ins and outs of match play and the kind of, of diligence and, and, and strategy and all that it takes, which is why you have to play the matches out and they don't just give John the trophy and say, Brad, you finished second. So it was really a tribute to the kind of thinker and competitor that Brad was. I, um, I saw a quote by Wayne Gretzky. Uh, and it was, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And when I talk to people who are struggling, and most of us have struggled multiple times, and, uh, you know, they have that idea of living day by day, these types of things. And, and you know, if you don't get off of your couch, off of your desk, out of your car, get if you don't get out of your comfort zone, and a friend of mine calls it circulating, he says, you got to get out and circulate you're never going to be able to test the waters and fee, see where you you could be useful, see where you could fit in and see where you could eventually thrive. Wouldn't that be a great thing? Like Nick Boletari, I don't know how much he was thriving when he was in his teens and twenties, but he kept chipping away at it. And then he developed maybe the premier uh, school of, of both kinds, academics and tennis in the world. And it, I believe it's, it, he's still uh, the man in charge. Is that your understanding? Uh, he's now actually quite ill and has backed off his responsibilities a bit. He still keeps quite a crazy schedule, but he's had a number of health issues that have that have sidelined him of late. Right. Jimmy he, Arias, his protege and also a contemporary of mine, has largely taken the reins now. Got it. Is is Jimmy Arias a college graduate, or did he did he leave college early? No, I don't. I'm not sure he's a high school graduate. He, you know, he started playing on the tour probably at 15 or 16. Was was he the, the original powerful forehand uh, of the tennis circuit, or was there somebody else who, who started doing more of the running around and blasting forehands? Well, there was, there was Borg at the time also um, that was a little bit before. I think forehand dominance existed before, but he was the prototype for the voluntary forehand. Um, 
He was one of uh, Nick's original students, Brian Godfrey probably being the first of them. And uh, that was a lot of how how Nick crafted his his coaching style uh, was, you know, Jimmy was somewhat of a template. Can, can you tell us, Gene, about your schedule in in high school? You mentioned that you were a good student uh, and, you know, share with us, if you would, uh, you know, how much you had to work in at your high school in Wayne, New Jersey. And then uh, you left early. And, you know, tell us about the graduation and then tell us, if you would, about the, uh, you know, keeping your learning going as, as far as being a literate person when you uh, you were post Stanford, if did you read books, maybe share with us mind, body and spirit, how you kept advancing yourself and in, in your development as a as a young man and as a professional? Well, it was, you know, it was a it was a pretty crazy schedule when I look back on it now in high school and into college. Um, normally, um, when I lived on Long Island and we had indoor courts more available when I lived in New Jersey, but it was normally up early in the morning and get a two hour practice session in before school started. So it would normally be 5.30, 6 o'clock tennis on the court, not easy in New York when the weather's not great and finding indoor courts. And then it would be school. And then after school, I'd usually have another two hours or so of tennis plus fitness, which was another hour. And then I'd have usually about three to four hours of homework. And then it wasn't a lot of energy left to get me in a lot of trouble because I was tired and, and needed to rest and, and get ready for the next day. Um, when I moved to New Jersey, the schedule was pretty much the same. The only difference was that I needed to take some college courses to be able to augment uh, my uh my studies to be able to, to skip my last year and go a year early uh, to college. So that added a bit of um, uh, there. And, uh, and college was unbelievably demanding at Stanford, coupled with three to four hours of tennis. So it was, uh, you know, people said, what was college like? I said, in some ways, it was a great place. And it was, it was great for tennis, great for school, but it was a blur. Um, yeah. You know, when they talk about college experience, I'm not sure exactly what that means because there was lots of studying and, and lots of lots of tennis. And then, Sifu, you really hit an important point because I think, you know, post-college and also you're out on the tennis tour and you're absorbed with so much in terms of your tennis that it's easy to not necessarily grow as a person. So...